So today we're going to talk about signs that you're with a covert narcissist. Um, the first thing I should say before I get into the signs that you're with a covert narcissist is that just remember that all of these things are not reality, they're a model of reality. So that doesn't mean we get to just make up whatever we want when we say, well, I think you should call all narcissists sociopaths. And I think, you know, we don't, you shouldn't really try and do that. But neither should you be too rigidly fixed in any one definition of what's going on. As somebody who is not an academic, who really is only, all I can try and do is, is help people um, with this issue is just say to them, look, the definition of exactly what you're dealing with and exactly what's going on is important, but it's not the ultimate thing. The ultimate thing is that you get to get on with your life and get over this. Um, speaking of somebody who's a victim of this type of abusive personality type myself. So whilst these kinds of defining things are important, don't get stuck on them. If the person is being abusive, that's enough for you to, to be looking for the door and to leave. You can always do uh, a post-relationship sort of, um, what do you call that, where you look at a dead body and analyze it for how it died. I can't remember, necroscopy. You can always do that when you've got time later. If somebody is being abusive, if they're showing a lack of empathy, if they're consistently putting their needs before yours, if you're stating what your emotional needs are and those are being completely disregarded or laughed at, if you're consistently being made to feel humiliated, then that is not good. And it shows that you're in a relationship with somebody who is abusive. So whether they're a type A1, cluster, zero, blah, 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 it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you're being abused and you need to get the fuck out. Where this is useful is that there is a mainstream idea now in the public consciousness, in layman consciousness of what a narcissist is. The term has been hijacked in the same way that the term psychopath was and is becoming less and less useful unless we stick to the rules. So defining a covert narcissist is useful because some clients that I speak to will say, well, I was looking up the defining means of knowing if somebody was a narcissist and I went through the checklist and the guy or the girl I was with didn't hit some of the things on the checklist and yet they were being abusive. So then we need a more subtle definition of narcissism. Uh, the people have done this in different ways. Some people have described it as like overt versus covert, um, arrogant versus shy, invulnerable versus vulnerable. Um, you know, the, the way that I used to define a covert narcissist was to say, okay, well, this person is comorbid with um, a borderline personality disorder by my understanding of the, of the symptoms. Covert narcissist itself is a tricky term because it implies that what the person is doing is under the radar. But everybody who's manipulative is doing stuff that's under the radar. A better term that might help us to shed more light on what it is, it's just to say shy narcissist. You could define them as a shy narcissist. There's a difference between a covert and an overt narcissist is simply that, it's, a, it's like a lack of confidence and more self-doubt. And that makes them interestingly quite different from overt narcissists in some of the ways that we'll look at now. Uh, tip number one or sign number one that you're with a covert narcissist is that you're here. You probably got here by doing a Google search or a YouTube search for what is a covert narcissist. Uh, I remember, I think it was sometime last year, I was looking around on the internet doing my own research and it was like signs you with a psychopath, a term that I don't particularly like. I prefer to use the proper psychiatric term, which is antisocial personality disorder. And it was one of these lists and it's 12 signs that you were the psychopath. And one of them was, it's turned you into a detective. If you're with any abusive personality type, it's going to turn you into a detective and somebody's out there looking for answers. So let's be honest with ourselves here. If you're here looking for answers, something is going on, right? Do you remember the film uh, Ronin? Uh, Robert De Niro plays a, an ex-CIA operative in that film. And he said, you know, when I used to work with the CIA, we had an expression. If there is any doubt, there is no doubt. If you're sat there wondering what the hell is going on, that's the biggest clue to me. And I've 
spent uh, two years now uh, coaching people almost exclusively as the victims of some kind of uh, emotional or narcissistic abuse and sign number one that they're with somebody who's a narcissist or an abusive personality type is the victim thinks they are. If you don't feel too good being around this person but you feel okay around everybody else, well that person is the common denominator that correlates between you feeling a certain way and being around them. So that is a fairly good, it's not the be all and end all because yes you might have a problem, you might have some psychological issue that makes you feel that way that's triggered by them, that's possible and we need to look at that but it's more likely that when you look at a stack of different signs that the problem is with that person. And the signs are not, you know, I don't want to overstate the sneakiness or the ability or the skill of uh, abusive personality types because that's been done to death and people talk about them as though they're some kind of like invincible geniuses and they're really not. The, the tactics that are used, they're actually fairly crude. It's only when you're in your hypno hypnotic brainwashed state of submission to this person that you're thinking, oh, they're so smart, they're so clever, how could anybody be so deceptive? And the reason you're doing that is the same reason that I do it. It's the ego kicking in to sort of defend us from saying, hey, I've been exploited and ripped off by somebody who's not even very skilled. They're kind of dumb. Uh, one of the signs for any narcissism, but particularly covert narcissism, is at a low level of emotional intelligence. These are not people who are, have a subtle, mature, you know, rich way of defining emotion and emotional relationships. They're just not very good at that. So their, their EQ, their emotional intelligence is actually usually pretty low which is the same for anybody in their cluster B of personality disorders. If you're particularly interested in looking that stuff up, it can be useful, but it's not absolutely necessary. So sign number one that you're with a covert narcissist is that you're here, you're asking the question, like they seem to be doing things that are manipulative, I've caught them lying, I've caught them with this projected sense of self, but then they don't match this lion-like, alpha, aggressive, arrogant, Patrick Bateman in American Psycho or any of the normal sort of like cultural representations we have of the quote unquote narcissist and a lot of uh, the literature that you read online is conflating opinion with fact which is a really naughty thing to do if you don't say that you're doing it. I always try and say that like I'll go this one is academic, this is peer reviewed research but this one is my personal opinion. That's what we should, that's what all of us who are putting this material out there should be saying. Okay, so the first sign is that you're looking for information and that if it's, the first, the first sign you're with a, an abusive personality type is you're on the internet looking for information about what the hell's going on. That's not normal, okay? That doesn't happen in normal relationships. You don't sit there going, hmm, I wonder what's up with this person. Let me go into Google and try and figure it out. That's a big sign that something is, is really, really up. The sign that you're with uh, somebody who is narcissistic and covertly narcissistic or a shy narcissist is because all narcissistic tactics are covert, are, are hidden, well, most of them are, um, is that the definition of an overt narcissist doesn't match what you're experiencing. You're getting something that's a little bit different. And usually it is that, well, uh, the person I'm with, if I'm pretending to be you, the person I'm with it seems to be a little bit more self-doubting. The person I'm with is not full of joy and bounce and narcissistic elation. Actually, a lot of the time, they look quite depressed and empty and, and low energy. So then people are going, well, well, maybe they're not a narcissist. Maybe it's me, maybe I'm the one with the problem. That's where this issue needs to be resolved. That's the second clue that you're dealing with a covert or shy rather than a classic or overt narcissist is that they do seem to have something missing. There does seem to be an emptiness with them. There does seem to be a tendency towards flatness and being kind of depressed and low energy and low motivation. The reasons for that are multiple. Uh, one of the things is that the, the shy narcissist versus the classic narcissist is, one is the lion, the predator, the alpha female or male. That was my ex was, was that way. Uh, the much more of an alpha sort of female, very overt and people could see that there was something up with it. The person who couldn't see that there's something up with it it's, it's sort of around here somewhere. <laughs> People would actually say to me, dude, there's, there's something up with that chick. They weren't going, your girlfriend has narcissistic personality. They were just like, dude, there's something up with your chick, you know. Um, but I was like, no, she's fine. I like abuse. 
Uh, so, yeah, it's 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 usually that you, with the shy narcissist you'll notice not the alpha lion, but more like the cowardly lion. So their tactics are cowardly. Their tactics are obtuse and round the houses because they're kind of in denial with themselves. The covert narcissist fights with themselves and feels deeply ashamed of their grandiosity at an internal level. Inside, they're fighting with the shame of like, oh, you know, it's like this mad, um, you know, that, that movie archetype that we've got uh, of, the, of the crazed professor who wants to take over the world, but there's also a voice inside of his head who's like, you know, you shouldn't be doing this or who, who not, not for a moral reason, not for the reason of, oh no, you shouldn't try and murder half the world's population just so that you can claim power. Not for a moral reason, but there's a voice inside of him going, who the hell do you think you are? Who the hell do you think you are? Damn you, vile woman. Um, so tip number three that you're with a covert narcissist is that you'll see a lot more of this anxiety and fretfulness and, and, um, and, and uh, sort of self-doubt and self-questioning and they're highly vulnerable to stress. So if they get tired, if they get stressed out, they actually start to go to pieces. Uh, you've got to remember that all of this is trauma-based, it's all a developmental issue. Um, so these people are the victims of, of trauma themselves. Um, they are carrying complex PTSD and some of those uh, CPTSD issues will start to kick in for them. Um, so they can seem very vulnerable and they are also, much like a borderline would be, ostentatiously vulnerable or conspicuously vulnerable. Uh, this for me is a huge red flag for covertly abusive personality types, whether you want to define them as borderline or narcissistic, is they're very vulnerable right in front of you. So it's like, rather, the, 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 there's a lot of sob stories, there's a lot of um, sympathy garnering, you know, the, the, they're not just getting narcissistic supply by, okay, I am better than everybody else, I'm the big lion. They're also getting uh, what I've started calling borderline supply by garnering sympathy. Now a true classic narcissist doesn't want sympathy because that means you're kind of above them, but this person who is a covert or shy narcissist who is probably comorbid with a bit of the borderline tendencies does want you to feel uh, sympathy and they will have, they'll be very, very um, vulnerable in front of you. I've even heard um, like kind of funny stories, if they would be funny if they weren't so sick, of people doing very dramatic things. Uh, like breaking down, crying in an extremely theatrical way, throwing themselves down on a bed, rushing around going, oh, oh this is a man. Uh, and his uh, girlfriend, ex-girlfriend is telling me like he was running around and crying in an extremely theatrical, oh my God, I can't believe what has happened to me, way. Uh, so there is, there is still drama there, but it's the drama of a shy person. Think about the flavour of what that would have. Somebody who is very dramatic, who's very reaction seeking, but they're shy. So oh, they want to do it, but they can't. So they're either like angry with you that you can't see what they, the reaction they're looking for and they're angry with themselves as well. There's a lot of anger in this uh, particular um, personality disorder. Uh, the sign number four is uh, both classic and covert or shy narcissist have extremely grandiose fantasies um, but the covert or shy seems to have a little bit more awareness of what demonstrating their grandiose fantasies could do to them in terms of manifesting them so they get sneakier they get ma more Machiavellian it's like if I tell everybody I want to take over the world people might resist me or judge me well I don't want to be judged because if I'm ever criticized I feel overwhelming sensations of humiliation the classic narcissist doesn't feel that. The, the covert narcissist does feel that. So they self-grandiose fantasies, but the covert is more likely to cover them, hide them. They are kufars. Um, the fifth thing uh, that some, not everybody says this, but some of the research that I read online said, is that actually coverts, unlike overt narcissists, know consciously that their projected self-image is false. They know it's false, but the classic narcissist, and you've got to bear in mind, this is all a spectrum of a disorder, and some people might be classic mixed with covert. It, it does get, it does get complex, it, and, and they might be more classic one day, 
when they're full of narcissistic elation because their plans are working, and then they might be more covert and sulky the next day when their plans didn't work out. So there's no hard and fast rigid rules here. But some of the people online, I found this really interesting, were suggesting that coverts know that their projected image is false, where a classic narcissist doesn't. The classic narcissist is so invested in their projected image that they've brainwashed themselves into thinking that that's who they really are. But the covert knows they're not, which causes uh, a lot more of the stress and the fretfulness and the worrying because they secretly think I'm not really worth anything. So they're more likely to underestimate their achievements and their abilities. Some of you might find this a bit confusing and might be getting a little bit exasperated at this point. Stick with me. They are extremely self-entitled. They do believe that they have a right to more things than the average person. They do believe that they're special, but at the same time as you, like try and hold this, this is alien territory to you if you're not a narcissist. I know, I understand it. You've got to like put your, um, your, your space suit on and your little mask and you've got to fly to this alien planet called Narcissus and you have to walk around there and learn the terrain. I know it's freaky, it's weird, but these people feel entitled are entitled, want more than everybody else and have no empathy for anybody else, but at the same time they hold the conflicting thought, I'm not good enough. I, I don't deserve anything. So they will actually, so somebody could be, a covert narcissist could be a brilliant painter and think that he's better, think on the one hand he's better than anybody else out there and that he is more deserving of, of more things than anybody else, but at the same time fight with the conflicting thoughts, this voice inside his head that's saying, you suck, you suck, you suck. In which case, if somebody ever says to him, are you a good painter? He might hide all of his fucking paintings and say that, that he's no good, even when a rational person go, come on, objectively, you've got to admit you're pretty fucking good. Complex, stick with it. Okay, so some people are suggesting the coverts know that they're full of shit. Um, sign number six, as I just mentioned, entitlement, and um, they are extremely entitled they are actually arrogant. They, if you notice, just like a classic narcissist, will also therefore never apologize. Why would a king apologize to a serf? Why would a lion apologize to a lamb? You know, I'm not gonna apologize to you, you're less than me. Um, so they are entitled, they are arrogant, they will refuse to apologize, but they are not confident. These are not confident people but they are entitled. It's like, well, how can I hold the two thoughts that they are entitled, but they're not confident, it's crazy. Well, they're kind of split and they're, they're fighting their split, which is another one of the reasons why they get, uh, why they're very vulnerable to stress because there's not much energy left in them and why they, they are, this type of narcissist is actually prone to depression, uh, self-pity, uh, self-isolation and, and withdrawal into the, the cave. Uh, sign number eight, there is a strong desire to be seen as a rescuer and they will try and project themselves as a good as gold person. Uh, this again, for me just personally now, this is not academic research. But another thing that I'm extremely aware, extremely aware of, I nearly said extremely aware of, I'm extremely aware of this, I'm extremely aware and very wary of is people who try and present a butter wouldn't melt in my mouth, my poo doesn't smell, um, personality or persona. Uh, it worries me. It worries me a lot when people act like that, like they're superior, like they're morally superior, like there's, there's things that other people do. I would never do that because there's this, this fake superiority. And it comes with a fake morality and a false humility as well. It bothers me a lot. Just now on uh, uh, Facebook, somebody was writing, I know a person, I'm not sure if they're a narcissist because they're a pillar of the community. And I wrote back to her saying, I hear from clients so frequently that the narcissistic abuser in their lives is a pillar of the community. I'm almost tempted to list being a pillar of the community as a fucking red flag. But that would mean then we doubt everybody and anybody who ever does anything charitable. The covert narcissist will tend towards charitable acts, helping children, helping animals, helping the environment, being involved in charity work, being involved with the local church, with the local mosque, with the local temple, whatever it is, and being seen as 
this benevolent, loving, uh, rescuer type of, of, of person. Um, tip number nine that you were the covert narcissist. These people use guilt tripping a lot, <clears throat> apparently a lot more. See, I, I never lived with a covert narcissist. I, there's somebody who I did, who, who I did live with for a short period of time. And I now wonder maybe if they were, if they were this way because of the typically narcissistic tactics they would use and then they would fall into uh, depression and self-pity like that very, very rapidly. Was he was an extremely manipulative man and he did also use guilt a lot. Um, but I'm not as familiar with this as I am with the overt uh, narcissistic type. Where apparently, uh, coverts will use guilt a lot more. Um, again, this feeds back into their self-pity. It feeds back into their sense of having been victimized, of being underappreciated, and it feeds back into uh, um, the, um, I'm sorry for saying um, so frequently, I feel terrible, ostentatiously vulnerable and very conspicuously vulnerable tactics. Look at me, I'm really struggling. Look at me, I'm in a lot of pain. Uh, please, I, I look at me, I was abandoned as a child, you know, or, or you know, somebody who, you know, somebody who just really advertises when they're in pain or is struggling, like a lot. Like, you might stub your toe and say nothing. This person will show you their stubbed toe and go, look, I stubbed my toe. It's a silly example, but it's the first thing that came into my head. I, I noticed stuff like that. And I really know stuff like that. I'm like, why are you putting that in front of me? Oh, I've, I've got no money right now. If only I knew a person that had some money they could give me. A money. Could you give me money? But, then, but not actually asking. Just flopping around in front of you with their pockets turned out going, Oh, I've got no money. Uh, right. <clears throat> Too much coffee. Uh, so, uh, tip number 10. They're extremely self-centered. Uh, this one is not hard to spot. You know, if you, if you fail to spot this one, ladies and gents, that shit is on you. You should be able to see when somebody is neurotically self-centered and they just don't have time for anybody else. They're just living the story of their life and it's all about them and what happened to them and everything just seems to swirl back to them, how they feel and what they're all about. I kind of cheated here and I stuck stubborn in here as well. Um, there is some people, not everybody, but some of the research online uh, indicated that the covert or shy narcissist is particularly stubborn. It, it makes sense if you think about it. Like I, if I lack assertiveness as a narcissist and I want my way, but I don't really feel, I don't want to overtly just tell you to do it, like go and give me money um, or go and do this for me. I have to go round the houses to do it. Stubbornness will be bred into that because I'm not going to ask you for what I want, but I'm also going to not let you not do what I want. So it's like a, it's like a passive, should we say a passive aggressive way of getting what you want? Extreme stubbornness. Um, and it goes without saying that these people have no respect for boundaries. I mean, no abusive personality type does, but a, a few people, um, Sam Vaknin and a couple of other people said that the covert narcissist is also recognizable by the fact that they, they lack generational boundaries and that because they have such poor boundaries, especially the generational boundaries, there can be a propensity towards incest, um, either actual physical incest or emotional incest within the family unit uh, of the covert narcissist. Uh, sign number 11 that I've, that I've got here is they're hypersensitive to criticism. They're very, they're, they're, they're hypervigilant to anything that looks like it could affect their self-image. More than the happy-go-lucky covert classic narcissist who just fucking know they're awesome, so nothing can bring them down because they're so confident in their own bullshit story that they've told themselves. So that there is, they're not as sensitive to criticism. Uh, they're, the classic narcissist is sensitive to narcissistic injury, but they don't always register criticism as narcissistic injury. I know some, but I know a couple of guys uh, who I've been friends with for years because I'm probably an inverted narcissist myself and I realize I've, I've had a lot of narcissists in my life. So I'm thinking I'm addicted to that or was it at least. Um, there's two guys who I know, very classic narcissists. Anytime I tried over the years to sort of bring things to their attention, 
kind of criticisms, I was very gently saying, you know, when you do this, I think you're hurting the feelings of that person. They, did, they weren't hypersensitive, they didn't get pissed off, they would laugh. They would usually laugh it off or reframe it so that they didn't do that or reframe it so that I was talking gibberish and more of that psychobabble nonsense. Is this more of your psychology? Ha 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 ha! So they continue to step on people's faces. Um, but the covert narcissist is actually hypersensitive to criticism. So even gentle criticism or professional criticism or constructive criticism could lead to a very emotional outburst. Uh, number 12, this is a big one guys. If you suspect you're with a covert narcissist, look out for the victim mentality. Everything I read online and everything that I've had clients tell me agrees with that, that the covert shy narcissist has a huge victim mentality. The one person I know who I think with hindsight now probably was a covert narcissist, the biggest victim on the planet. The, no, but it was like um, kind of like a, a, a messiah complex, but the messiah that nobody recognized complex. I would have been Jesus himself if only people weren't so stupid and they could see how wonderful I am. If only they could see the wonder that I see in myself was, he never actually fucking said that, but the implicit doctrine of his repeated narrative would always lead back to um, that place. So he was... He would always be the biggest victim in the room, even when it was clearly him who'd done the most awful things to people who were completely innocent. Um, he would he would manage to twist it around inside of his own head so that he was the one being victimized, which is truly remarkable. Uh, so number 13, another big one, ladies and gents to watch out for, is they tend to project their own insecurities and defects onto you, the partner, and now, you are either a codependent, black sheep style partner, or you might be more like me um, and dealing with your own narcissism issues through uh, childhood trauma, whatever it is. Sam Vaknin has come up with this, uh, with, the, with the term, he coined it, I believe, and it's, it's been accepted, which is the inverted narcissist. So previously I would have said, nah, I'm much more borderline. I'm much more, if you want to give me a personality disorder, I would probably fit the borderline, which I do for a lot of the checkboxes, but not at all for, for some of the other ones. But I have had a conspicuously large number of classic, overt, aggressive narcissists in my life. The type of people who other people who I knew in the various social circles that I was involved in ab abandoned because they were so badly behaved. Um, there was, I think I've told this story on this channel before, where there was a point where I was living in Malaysia, not that long ago, maybe 18 months, two years ago now, where I was having WhatsApp conversations and I looked at my WhatsApp and I was like, wow, the top seven people that I have regular contact with, either meeting up face to face or I'm chatting to them on Skype or chatting to them online or chatting to them on WhatsApp, the top seven people I have the most contact with, they all would register fairly highly on the spectrum of narcissism. That's called an inverted narcissist. That means that my narcissistic tendency is not to be the narcissist myself, it's to be more covert. Sam Backman says a, a intro, an introverted narcissist is a form of covert narcissism, is to attach myself to overt narcissists. And as I look through my relationships or in the past, before I got well, because I'm fine now, um, before I got well, was I was attaching myself. Uh, so people have asked me, can you get addicted to narcissistic abuse? Can you deliberately pick people who are narcissists even when you see that they're narcissistic? The answer would be yes, you can do that because there is a, an addictive quality to that. And it means that you probably are a little bit personality disordered. You probably have what, what's been defined as the inverted narcissism. Uh, so the sign number 13 is that they project a lot. A lot more than classic narcissists do the same thing, but the covert narcissist projects a lot of their own insecurities and defects onto you, the partner. Um, sign number 14, they paint a picture of a perfect childhood. I hear this all the time from people, all the time from, from clients that the person they're with, I'll say, well, what did they say about their childhood? I mean, maybe they had like some abuse go on there, maybe something wasn't too good at home. And they'll say, no, 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 the person I was with, the girl I was with, the guy I was with, they painted, you know, their childhood was perfect, their parents were wonderful, blah, blah, blah. 
um, and that can be an indicator, an indicator, one indicator of covert narcissism. Uh, number 15, even though they are ostensibly shy, ostensibly um, humble, ostensibly empathic, and usually their humility and their empathy is pretty easy to see through if you spend any length of time with them. It's very hyper-sentimentalized, very reaction-seeking, very... These are, these are the type of people who, when they're discussing anything that's to do with human emotion or vulnerability, they sound like a series of lines from a film uh, written by some fucking old Hollywood hack who's just repeating crap that he got from other films. Um, and there is some suggestion out there that what happens is these people with the personality disorders will actually use films and TV shows to spew back the human emotions they know they're supposed to feel, but that they that that but that they don't. In my um, final narcissistic uh, abusive relationship, which ended uh, five six years ago now, I actually had communication from her in which she cited examples from fiction, from films, and from TV shows where people did what she had done and it was okay. And I was like, you do know that those aren't real people, that that's not a real situation. So this idea of, 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 of them being empathic, of them being sort of uh, compassionate and humble is, is an idea, it's a projected image. Beneath all that, the 15th sign that you're dealing with the covert narcissism is that you will, the mass will slip and you'll see this deep pus-filled reservoir of rage. They're extremely angry, they're extremely bitter and they're very resentful. And the reason why they're so angry is it's like the spoiled toddler syndrome they see other people getting things that they want and they're furious about it this isn't like oh I'm slightly envious that you went to go on a holiday and I didn't lucky old you this is like how dare you I deserve that and you've got it I must destroy you now they're really furious people but the fury doesn't match the um, the self-image of this good as gold, loving, charitable, rescuer persona, so it gets repressed. But if you live with somebody, you're going to see that fury come out. Um, not necessarily like we're talking about shy people ultimately, so it might not be, you know, physical violence, screaming at the top of their lungs and breaking tables. It might be um, like a cold uh, rage. Um, Tip number 16, they're generally dysfunctional. Okay, everybody who's a cluster B or an abusive personality type tends to be quite dysfunctional. You do get your overt narcs who, who actually are on the surface seem to have their life together, but with the shy narcissists, because they're not assertive, they're full of self-doubt, they're full of worry, their lives tend to be quite messy. So never look at where somebody's life is right now, but do look at where it has been and what kind of cycles of behavior they've gone through. Um, it sounds a little cheap, I know, but I'm going to say it anyway. Uh, there is an expression in psychiatry and in psychotherapy that the best indicator of future behavior, the best indicator of future behavior is previous behavior. It's pretty true. Like people repeat, people are machines, have a machine like quality to them, and they tend, you know, at some level, at a certain biological Bio, biologic, biomechanical model of the human being, uh, which can be useful, there is a machine-like nature to what we do, and we tend to repeat a lot. So if they're in a generally dysfunctional state in their lives and they've got like a series of broken businesses behind them, a series of broken relationships behind them, a series of people who they fell out with, it's highly likely that they're going to have a theory of that in the future and that you're going to be one of those broken businesses, relationships, friendships, enterprises that they got involved with because they repeat, they do the same thing again and again. Uh, clue number 17 is this uh, propensity towards depression. Uh, the narcissist, the classic overt narcissist, is, tip, is typically uh, sort of portrayed as quite a happy-go-lucky person because if they're successful in their narcissistic endeavor of, of aggressively but Machiavellianly pursuing narcissistic supply they'll be in a state of narcissistic elation pretty much all the time and they will be quite cheerful and quite happy the classic narcissists who I know tend to look like that but this shy narcissist is prone to depression 
Um, tip number 18. Uh, oh, when they're depressed, by the way, they, they tend to have a very negative outlook on life. They get like an Eeyore sort of a, a, a persona going on. Everything sucks, nothing goes my way. This is the sulking of a child. This is why I agree with Freud about narcissism, that it's a developmental issue. And that when provoked or triggered, the narcissist will go back to the kind of mental processes of a, of a four-year-old. I didn't get the ice cream that I wanted because I never get what I You know, it becomes this like, it's the biggest thing. I hate you because you didn't buy me one ice cream one time. Everything is awful. There's a huge generalization. It's extremely petulant and, uh, you know, overblown and hyperdramatic. So they're prone to depression because that's going on inside of their heads. You know, they tried to do some narcissistic, round the houses, shy narcissist tactic to get supply, and it fell through. Because if you're not assertive and you're trying to do manipulation shyly, it's going to be hard, right? It would be like trying to juggle balls but just using your fingertips. That's a really weird metaphor. That wasn't a good one. Let's leave that one. Um, but it, it leaves them feeling depressed and empty and like, what's the point? Full of despair. Uh, tip number 19 um, is that they, uh, sorry, 18, is that they will, I mentioned the victim mentality before, they really, really feel underappreciated and they moan loudly about that. Um, these are the people who would be like, nobody understands me, everybody in the world is an idiot, and, and they might never actually come right out and say it, but they'll hint and they'll imply, and the implicit doctrine and the narrative that they spin usually points in a certain direction, and the direction is, I'm amazing, but nobody can see it. I'm amazing, but nobody will give me credit because the world isn't ready for my genius just yet. Number 19, lying. These people are gonna lie their asses off. I mean, that, that makes sense. The, the classic narcissist does too. The borderline does too. Anybody who's gonna be manipulative is gonna lie. But these people are, are because of the shyness they don't have the emotional muscle, if you will, to be classic narcissists. So they've got to use more passive tactics. That being stubborn um, and breaking boundaries, you know, the type of person who will never take no for an answer, that is something that they have to use because they don't have the other tools of a narcissist. So they have to rely on these more. And lying is a big part of that. You've got to remember, with all of the cluster B personality disorders, and particularly with narcissism, these are shame-based disorders. So anything that could make them feel, shame is so overwhelming and so despair-inducing to these people that it's almost impossible for them to admit fault and apologize because the shame, even if they, there's so much backed up shame that if they just open the doorway to just a little piece of shame, they're worried that the whole thing is gonna fall out and destroy them. And they do feel things that you don't feel and that I don't feel um, that, that are overwhelming where certain emotions aren't just oh that emotion is icky oh god I gotta go through it okay fine they don't feel that way they'll be like certain emotions are so strong it will destroy everything I, have, I, I am and everything I have and they just can't do it so you know they, they, they do everything to avoid feeling shame they also do everything to avoid feeling vulnerable once, the, once you can't feel shame anymore once you refuse to feel vulnerable, empathy is going to die off very, very quickly after that because you're now not in contact with your true self, your real emotions, so you can't feel empathy anymore. Uh, so these people are going to lie. They're going to lie to cover. The whole personality is a shell that covers a wounded something, uh, a, a hidden, secret, shameful something. Um, you know, that's why you'll hear a lot of people who are good at a family therapy or a family therapist would be saying like, you know, we need the secrets out. We need the secrets out in the light, not for some fake moralistic bullshit reason of like, oh, you know, or some like quasi religious thing. Get your secrets out because that's gonna be 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 be. But because it's actually the secrets that create the personality disorders and the darkness that can lead to huge amounts of abuse. And the secrets are usually shameful. They're usually things that, that make people feel vulnerable. So lying becomes an effective way of not just getting what you want, but of covering up the, the unacceptableness that, we, that the shy narcissist feels about themselves. 
Um, okay, the final, I started with the victim, the target of narcissistic abuse, like the sign that you're with a narcissist is that, hey, you're here, you're looking for information, so it's a pretty good sign. I'll end with that. What's the effect on the victim? Uh, the effect on the target of a, a covert narcissist can be really, really, really bad uh, because if you're with a if you're with an overt, like it's it's like I've given this metaphor before. If if you come home, if I come home and my partner slaps me in the face and throws boiling water on my arm, I can be like, oh, my face hurts and my arm hurts because she slapped me in the face and threw boiling water on my arm. But if I come home and my partner just slowly, subtly corrodes my sense of reality and my sense of self-confidence over time, I can't point to anything. And I can never really know if she's doing it or not. I can never really say. So the covert narcissist can drive people crazy. Um, some of the research I read online uh, but just before shooting this video said that it can actually leave people with quite serious uh, physical symptoms anxiety disorders that get so bad they'll actually leave you with a permanent heart murmur um, because, and I have seen, I've only seen it once, but I've seen somebody driven to the point of a full-blown nervous breakdown by, an, by a covert narcissist. The worst state I've ever seen a client in was with a covert narcissist who had recruited the help of not one but several therapists to convince the victim that she was the crazy one. That's how smart this guy was. And the entire time he maintained the benevolent, uh, giving, magnanimous um, sort of, uh, you know, persona while saying, you're the crazy one, you're the crazy one. Come and you, you say I'm crazy, you say I have narcissism. Okay, and then he went and studied narcissism. And he said, well, I've studied narcissism and I've been to therapist. And she said, I'm absolutely not narcissistic. There's no way I'm narcissistic, it's you. And then he would take the, that target, that victim, that person, to the same therapist, and that therapist would repeat the, the, the evil doctrine that it was actually her. That, so she was made to believe that she was a problem. After years of this kind of, uh, of gaslighting and provoking and manipulation and psychological torture, uh, yeah, she was in a very, 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 very bad way, extremely underweight, um, jumpy and twitchy in a way that I have only ever, I used to work in uh, the security industry, so I've seen, I was a, I was a nightclub um, bouncer, some people call it doorman, for, for 10 years in various places all over the world, and I've seen a lot of violence uh, taking place. This person looked like somebody who had either just witnessed a horrific violent incident or being the victim of one themselves there is a twitchiness and um, a certain mode of speech and a breathlessness that you can't fake that is not oh I'm very very upset right now or I'm full of grief it's something else it's a dysregulation that is in the biology where the person is is absolutely hyper adrenalized and they're jumping at shadows the breathing has a certain tone to it, the voice has a certain tone to it, the eyes will dart around in a certain way, the whole body shakes, you know, this is a, the, the nervous system is, is a, kind of being smashed up uh, in a way that, you know, you can't really do unless, you're, unless you've managed to convince the person that they are going crazy, which is what this guy did. So, can covert narcissists go out and learn about narcissism and trick therapists? Yup they can. Uh, could there be a propensity towards a covert narcissist being more cerebral than somatic, meaning they're drawing their narcissistic supply from their intellect rather than from their body? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I don't see any reason, somebody asked me that, I don't see any reason why somebody couldn't be somatic and introverted, but yes, we can agree, I think, that it's more likely that the shy narcissist is going to be more cerebral, more academic, more intellectual uh, than um, they'll be like, look at my amazing brain, rather than look at my amazing abs. Uh, that's going to be the tendency that we're going to see playing out. Okay, guys, um, I hope you enjoyed that video. Uh, as ever, you know, if you've got any comments or questions, just post them in the, uh, uh, the your comment section below. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. I was a little bit all over the place there today. Sorry about that, uh, but hopefully it was still useful. 
Thank you, and I will speak to you again soon. Cheers.